The Spin-Off Podcast Network. Are you making the most of your KiwiSaver investment? Generate is an award-winning KiwiSaver provider with a track record of strong long-term performance. Making a smart decision now could add tens of thousands of dollars by the time you reach retirement. Book a no-obligation chat with a Generate KiwiSaver advisor today at generatekiwisaver.co.nz slash advice. A copy of the product disclosure statement is available at generatekiwisaver.co.nz. The issuer of the scheme is Generate Investment Management Limited and, of course, past performance does not guarantee future returns. I'm Toby Manhire and this is Juggernaut, the story of the fourth Labour government. A podcast in six parts. Doesn't give my opponents much time to run up to an election, does it? This nation is at risk. What do you think you're up to now, you perverted little liar? I can smell the uranium on it as you lean towards it. <laughs> There's a radical overhaul in the history of New Zealand's administration. Juggernaut, the story of the fourth Labour government. Made with the support of New Zealand On Air. Listen now on the spin-off or wherever you get your podcasts. Um, ben, you're going to hurt to... someone you love, but you're doing it for the love of everyone else. Exactly. Are we recording this, Alice? Yeah, okay. Well, let's just rock and This has gone by lunch. I know my heart and my pick my cack and my Ben Thomas, I'd like to apologise to you for cutting your copy of a piece you wrote in the spin-off. Do you want to do You had a gag at the top. Do you want to do it now? No, it's fine. We'll just, we'll do, we'll just like, like everything else I do, I'll just slip it in organically into oh, the I podcast. Oh, I see. You prepare. Pre- as if I just came right. up with it. Okay. Just at that moment. Okay. But you have practiced it that way, so it'll be good. Yeah, that's why I was late. Um, I was just sitting in the car, like repeating it, trying to get the cadence right. Mm. Annabelle Lee Matha, nice to see you. How are you? You too. Good. I'm wearing daytime clothes in the daytime, so obviously (laughs) we've gone down an alert level, which is exciting. It's the old normal. Back Um, to the old normal. No more PJs till five. um, Can I just say thank you to Flick Electric? who uh, make this podcast possible. Um, you can check them out by clicking through on any politics post on the spin-off. They're cool. We like them. Um, and this podcast was going to be about, when we set it up, we're going to talk about the budget. Um, since which, actually, hang on. Can I do this? Will this listen? Wait, hang on, try. Bueller. 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 That's my first question for you, Ben, as a National Party <laughs> insider. Um, <laughs> is it Bueller? Is it Mueller, Muller, or Muller? I'm so confused. I felt not, like a dick all week about not, that. It's definitely not Mueller. It's phonetic. It's Muller. Is it it's Muller? Muller. Muller. And not Muller. Not Muller. Not like the German Muller. footballer. No, he's not some dirty foreigner. He's died in the wolf. Died in the wool, Kiwi True and Blue mm. National. Mm. He was carved out of a Cody fence post mm. in the National Party workshop. Mm. <laughs> a mm. suit was slapped on him, mm. and a National Party rosette, and he was put into the Bay of Plenty electorate. Mm. Mm. And uh, they, they, they produce many different models, and they, that's the great thing on the campaign trail. <laughs> He'll be able to be at several hustings at the same time. Mm. That's right. You, you which, which Muller will you get? Muller. Uh, Muller. <laughs> Muller. Not Muller. 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 No. What did Muller. I say? You said Mueller. Did I? No. Oh. The, I said Matt Ducey. We, no one knows no. what we're talking about because no one has heard of this fellow. <laughs> <laughs> His name is Todd. Um, and um, as we we are recording this on Thursday morning, actually what I thought I'd do, I'll do this now, I'll do this now. Um, my pick is that Simon Bridges is definitely going to remain as leader. My pick is that Todd Muller is definitely going to take over as, from Simon Bridges as leader. Alice, can you just cut out one of those when we put this live on, on Friday? Wait, wait, wait. I agree. Right. What do you and think, Ben? In. Yeah, that's what I've been saying all along. Um, the challenge is going to happen in an emergency caucus meeting on Friday morning. Um, and uh, it uh, seems all but sure that it will be the ticket, a ticket of Todd Muller and Todd Mueller and Todd Muller uh, with Nikki Kay as Is would it be Nikki Kay or Nikki Kaye? Kaye, Kanye. Kanye. Um, N- Nikki Kaye, so it's sort of <laughs> done in a kind of um, <laughs> what is, what, like shamanistic sort of voice, way. Like right. Kind of <laughs> diehard kind of. Like. Nikki Kaye. Nikki <laughs> Kaye. 
<laughs> I feel like this is a special Paul Simon record that's about to be loosened upon the world. Um, versus the incumbents who are Simon Bridges and Paula Bennett. Mm. Sometimes pronounced Paula Benefit. Yes, that's a tricky one too for, for everybody. <laughs> or Paula Benet in <laughs> France. <laughs> um, uh, and what's going to happen? Bells, what, um, uh, which way do you see the cookie crumbling? Um, well, I listened to Jamie Lee Ross, and mm. he's convinced that um, that Simon has done a deal with um, Mitchell and and Judith Collins, and that he will be safe, that he'll hang in by the skin of his teeth. Mm. But I tend to agree with what Michelle Bogue said this morning. You're which always is that agreeing with Michelle Bogue. Me and you? Michelle, because we went to Auckland Girls Grammar. Yes. So yeah. She's my mentor. She's a co-old really. girl like yeah. me. Yeah. Um, I, I tend to agree that, that Mueller, Muller, Muller, mm. Mara, mm-hmm. probably has the numbers. Mm-hmm. And, and what a, I mean, it's a good looking ticket, right? You've got like, as you said, the old school died in the wool, traditional national party, uh, dude um, with the young, bright star, urban liberal Nikki Kay. I mean, it seems like you've got all your bases covered there. In terms of uh, profile, Nikki Kay is much better known than uh, Thomas Mueller, <laughs> right? <laughs> uh, like, I, I mean, she obviously had um, uh, breast cancer and had to recover from that, and that sort of took her out of politics for a while. But there was a lot of talk that Nikki Kay was the only person who could beat Jacinda Ardern having done it uh, Mm. twice in Auckland Central. Um, How come it's Todd and Nikki and not Nikki and Todd challenging for the National Party leadership, Ben? Yeah, Nikki Kay and Jacinda Ardern comparisons are easy and trite and tiresome. But actually, I think in this case, they're apt in terms of, you know, before Jacinda Ardern became uh, Labour Party leader eight weeks out from the last election, she was very much on record as saying she didn't want to be leader, She uh, that wasn't in her plan, she had no ambitions to be leader. And I think largely she was telling the truth, um, and then it was sort of foist upon her um, because of the, the precipitous position that Labour was in and the fact that they had tried all of their indistinguishable grey middle-aged men um, they had all been thrown onto the front and, you know, been mown down by the National Party. Nikki is the same. She's been pretty clear that she doesn't want to be leader. Um, I think she's telling the truth. Uh, she came back from that uh, breast cancer scare. Well, not scare, breast cancer. Um, mm. She survived. Mm. Um, she came back, I think, with quite a new approach to life. She's much more uh, relaxed than she used to be, much more easygoing, a bit sort of probably comes across as a bit personally warmer, mm. um, in addition to, you know, still being this kind of frenetic workaholic, mm. you know, with this kind of tireless work ethic. Mm. Um, you know, I think she would be probably the hardest working uh, MP in New Zealand. Um, but, you know, I, 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 and I, I wouldn't rule out that Nikki would be the leader one day, but I think it, will be a, it would be at a time when, you know, the caucus was demanding that she become the leader. Um, that's not the situation now, and I, I, I don't think she has any personal ambition to be the leader at the moment. Um, but at, at the same time, you know, now, I mean, we should note Nikki Kay hasn't confirmed that she would be the deputy for Muller, and neither has Muller. So that's that's just... Well, I mean, he sent a letter to the caucus, so that's... that's, it, that's it didn't, that's didn't mention... Nikki. Yeah. No, oh, sorry, I, I, did you mean that he hasn't confirmed that Nikki is... He, yeah, he's it, confirmed right? that he'll be yes, challenging, yes, that's but true. he hasn't confirmed that's that true. Nikki will be on that's his true. ticket. And I think it's Nikki one of those occasions it's where one the, of those the, everyone the by knows. omission, yeah. you, can, you, can, you can reasonably yeah. infer yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Nikki, is there Nikki any chance is able that it's to, not Nikki? There's a, I think there's a chance that she would say actually no, but I think it's, I think, I think it's one of those weird things. I think often in, um, you know, 
political podcasts and the like, people massively overstate the role importance of a deputy. And, and, and I think if you asked um, a lot of New Zealanders who the deputy leader of the Labour Party is, they wouldn't, wouldn't know. Um, I think they would. They'd, but, they'd, they'd know it was Grant Robertson. <laughs> <laughs> He's the, is he the... I thought he was co-leader. The... Um, <laughs> The um the but in terms of the kind of as a ticket as the sell, mm. she is a critical part of that given her profile and given her given her CV, you know. And National likes these double acts. Uh, the party, you know, for whatever reasons, historically has liked a kind of balance. You know, it used to be a North Island leader and a. South Island deputy or a South mm. Island more more often a national actually a South Island leader and a, a North mm. Island deputy a, a, a male leader a female deputy or a female leader and a male deputy uh, a liberal and a conservative because the National Party you know its core reason for being is to keep Labour out of power but it comes from those two traditions the merging of the Conservatives and the Liberals and the old Parliament um, and so so Nikki Kay's very well established liberal socially progressive credentials are not actually the handicap that some people have been making them out to be because national does actually respect those sort of two parts of its provenance and they like to see that balance reflected Muller is regional right. she's urban all right it's a broad church all of that sort of thing it's the you know the national party likes to think itself as the kind of natural party of government all that stuff but how does the caucus break down in this race um, because we know there's a kind of bit of a rump in there of a kind of religious conservative element in there. Um, uh, not, not, can, can, we can overstate that, of course, but there is a group and presumably they coalesce with uh, the more sort of your standard kind of conservative, you know, Tory type branch and then Muller and, uh, and Muller and Nikki Kay represent a kind of more, for want of a better word, a more liberal or more progressive part of the party. Is that is that how it breaks down, or is that too simplistic? No, I think that's simplistic. Muller is a conservative. He's a social conservative. He voted against abortion reform. Um, he is not, you know, he is he's not an urban cafe mm. uh, kind of politician. Mm. You know, he's 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 worked in the commercial world, but it was for Zespri. You know, uh, and Fonterra as well. Z- Zespri and Fonterra, so mm. primary industries, getting out there at field days, worn in the gum boots, that kind of thing. Um, you know, even if, if he is the kind of uh, regional guy who has, you know, a three hundred dollar Swan Dry and hundred and fifty dollar Red Band gum boots, he's still rural and regional. Mm. Um, and so, I, I don't think there's that clear opposition between socially conservative Bridges and progressive Muller, because Muller is not particularly progressive. Mm. Um, K is that's hence that balance and kind of act. I think where the deputy issue comes into it, because again, yeah, I, I think you're right. Tradition often the role of the deputy is overstated. You know, it, it doesn't actually add that much to the campaign. But where it might come into this is there is, you know, a couple of years ago I wrote a as it turned out to be extremely wrong column for the spin-off mm. about how Paul Levine Did anyone um, uh, vandalise your copy and take take out the owning power? Was that one molested? No, I mean that then it would have come in handy because it turned out I was wrong. Right. But, um, but I predicted that Paula Bennett would go before Bill English uh, because of the dissatisfaction <coughs> within the caucus. Mm. And that dissatisfaction has grown. The, Paula Bennett is not a popular deputy. Um, there's a lot of misgivings in the caucus uh, about her and about the sort of roles that she's assumed for herself, including campaign chair. Um, and just as I think there is a perception in the caucus that Bridges is a drag on the National Party vote, mm. there is probably another perception as well that Bennett is a drag on Bridges even mm. further. So I think that is the reason for the ticket challenge. Last time there was a leadership challenge, um, Bridges replaced English, Bennett, the great survivor, stayed in as deputy. That's why that's not an option this time. Why Why is she unpopular, Ben? I think there is probably a perception in the caucus that Bennett, since she was promoted by Key to, um, or since she, since she was promoted by Key out of MSD and into what she saw as a slew of sort of more economic and more technical portfolios, probably hasn't performed at the level uh, 
commensurate to the responsibility that she has asked for. And I think that in- also includes uh, her work as policy chair for national and their election campaigns and as uh, now as campaign chair. Um, and, you know, her style is polarizing as well, you know, a word that we're hearing a lot of right now. Mm. Um, and and a lot of the deputy role is actually that liaison with the caucus, you know, making sure that everyone's happy. And Bennett's not bad at that, but you know, she you know, there are and she certainly has a lot of fans. She's very good at cultivating loyalty within her own staff, within her own office. Um She's brought a lot of key staff into that leader's office with Bridges. Um, but it would be fair to say that she is not a widely popular deputy and uh, and probably counts against Bridges in this contest. Mm. Let's talk a bit about how we got here. Why Annabelle uh, National confronting a leadership contest in the first place? What is it about Simon Bridges' performance? One of the one of the things that he said, and and it's hard to argue with it, is that the all of the political oxygen has been soaked up by the leader who's been given kind of, you know, from his point of view, there have been like daily, daily speeches from the throne, you know, and uh, you've got an emergency mode, uh, with um, quite properly you have the 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 prime minister addressing the nation uh, routinely, it, n- normal politics stops. What could he have done differently? Is it? Is it, do you have any? Do you have sympathy for Bridges in this? In this? In this mess? I do have sympathy for Simon Bridges. I think you'd have to be a pretty callous person not to have sympathy for anyone in his position. He obviously, um, you know, is passionate about the National Party and feels that he can make a strong contribution to the country. Um, obviously, as a descendant of Ngāti Mani Apoto, um, you know, I like the idea that there is a Māori man leading the National Party, but he... Um, the Jacinda Ardern COVID-19 stuff aside, he was already sliding and... There were some little peaks here and there. But he just has, I think, his weakness is his soft skills mm. and an inability to to understand what people's real concerns are and play to them and equally how to not come across as someone who's just barking at, at every car going past. I mean, people say that being in opposition is the hardest job in politics, and in some ways it is, but it's also quite, um, uh, you know, it's a lot easier to throw stones um, than it is to actually have to come up with solutions. And I feel like when he does throw stones, he he's not actually hitting the target. Mm. Um I think that while it's true that, you know, all politicians around the world are, you know, um, what any government in crisis tends to have a lot of support and, you know, we're saying crazy stuff like how popular Trump is d- despite his abysmal um, response to COVID, I, I think that Simon has failed to capitalise on on some of the opportunities he's been given, like um, chairing the the epidemic response committee. And I, I don't necessarily think that he's completely done and dusted. And who knows he, if he does lose, we, we may even see him come back. But mm. I, I just think that he, um. He's just out of step with the rest of the... Ca- it, it's such an intangible thing. Mm. Mm. But whatever it is, he he hasn't tapped into it. Weirdly, one of the th- things that I noticed is that he, when he gave rounds of interviews yesterday morning and he strategically decided to out the challenges, um, he didn't name them, but he was the one who announced that there was the coup was on. You know, he sees the initiative. He sees the initiative. He he kind of if it's a game of poker, he called the hand. You know, mm. um, and uh, in that interview, I thought he was 
really strong. And it reminded me of some yeah. of his interviews after the whole Jamie Lee Ross, your 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 man, uh, Annabelle, your mentor, your um, spiritual guide. When he after that whole affair to, to, to Jamie Lee Ross, he Bridges was quite strong then too. It's kind of this weird. It's kind of almost this paradox that mm-hmm. when his back's against the wall, he, you know, and and, and you know, we know his wife called him a, a street scrapper or whatever, and 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 I don't know if the, if that's true, um, but. He does seem to rise to those moments, and it's kind of weird. And you kind of think, shit, if he could somehow channel some of that flow, I sort of wonder. Sometimes I wonder whether he's got a bit of a case of the thing that you saw sometimes with David Shearer, where you could almost imagine him second guessing himself, editing, mm-hmm. editing his own line of, uh, of of speech. You know, you know that kind of that that when the the brain is moving at a different pace to the mouth, and you, your advisors are imagined in your ear or on your shoulder. I don't know. I do wonder sometimes with him too if instead of really going with his gut reaction or what Mm. he genuinely believes or what he really knows is the right thing to do, if he's constantly kind of projecting out and thinking, what is it that these people want to hear? What about this side and what about that side? And I've had conversations with him about ihu mātou and stuff and I think that you know, underneath it all, he does know that, you know, it's a righteous stand that they're making out there, but but that doesn't translate well with national... That'd be a flex, eh, for um, Simon Bridges to go to Himatau on, <laughs> on Friday ahead of the caucus vote. Well, I, I, I guess what it comes down to is, you know, he... Um, perhaps, in those moments when you see him with his back against the wall, that's probably genuinely him yeah. unfiltered, yeah. not overly strategized or overly thought through. Yeah. It's like his genuine not, this from is the what, heart. This kind is of what politics. the leader of the National Party is meant yes. to say at this moment. And there, you're looking very skeptical there, Ben. Yeah, ben doesn't I'd, like this line of line no. of thought. Yeah, I'd, no. I'd have two observations about that. The, the first is I think that yeah, he he does. Uh, I think he has this sort of idea of how he wants to project that's always in his mind. So, and that's where, you know, I thought the disastrous moment of that poll result was when he made the wise crack about the Prime Minister's hair, you know, yes. about the dying or whatever. And look, you he can tell... He was led into that. Of, course he, of was course he was led into it. Of it, course he was being know, like, needled. But yeah. remember, it's it's only about a year and a half ago since he was, you know, goaded into talking about the non-gender specific baby of the PMs or whatever. You've got to learn mm. from this sort of thing. Yeah. If if Simon Bridges mm. hasn't figured out by now that Tover O'Brien is trying to trap him into saying something embarrassing on the news, then, <laughs> then you know he's got to be a bit of a faster study than that. Mm. <laughs> the the so you, you've got to learn to adapt like that. But the thing is, I think that he believes that you know he's got to show himself and his sense of humour and his personality mm. or whatever that whatever mm. politicians have in in their minds. You always hear this from opposition leaders. They say, "I've, we, you know, the public has just got to get to know me." Mm. Well, look on a personal level, you know, whether Simon Bridges is likable or whether Jacinda Ardern is likable are subjective matters. You might think they're likable, you might not. On a statistical population level, it is a fact that Simon Bridges is not likable. You know, there, there are there are most people are quite likable. You know, it's it's the same. I guess it's the difference. Let me put it this way, you know, when you say that, you know, uh, somebody is likable, but then you try and translate that to being likable to the whole population of New Zealand for an election campaign, that's the same way that most of us think we can, you know, make our friends laugh and that we're funny people and then go and do a stand up open mic night. Right. And you find out that it's a very different skill set. And I, th- I think Bridges hasn't made that kind of leap yet. Look, um, when you when you when you talk about that poll, um, it was a devastating poll in lots of ways. One which mirrored uh, other private polling for the Labour Party, and or, or, or at least by UMR, and and it seems also internal polling for the National Party, which hasn't been shared with Caucus. But the the killer numbers are, and I mean, put it this way. According to their read poll for News Hub, three in ten New Zealanders would vote for the National Party, which is you know that's that's fewer than less than one in ten, less than one in twenty 
less than one in 20 would want Simon Bridges to be prime minister. And that's just, I mean, if you're, if you, if, if, if you're a member of, the, if you're a national MP, you just look at that and you go, yeah. well, that's, is that survivable? And, and, and the interesting part of that is that you would have thought that the people who wanted Simon Bridges to be prime minister would be the more hardcore National Party supporters, right. Right. you know, who were still in that 30% that right. remained after they lost yes. you know, 15 or whatever. Yes. You would have, th- you know, your instinct would be, well, you know, people who are in the middle wouldn't that be like, number I stays Bridges strong. to be the Prime exactly. Minister, right? Yeah. So you'd think that it wouldn't have dropped much. Yeah. So I think that is a bit of a key that, you know, he has performed badly. And look, of course, he's unlucky here. You know, he wasn't sliding before COVID. In fact, he was poised to become the Prime Minister of New Zealand. Um and on both the, on on the all the on the on the, on the on the on the previous yeah. three Colmar yeah. Brunton polls, he was in. He was, in, was in pole position. Yeah. yeah. Now his you know, numbers who, still weren't great. By the his way, his personal but, numbers yeah. weren't. Numbers. His, his personal numbers weren't. But yeah. National was holding steady. Yeah. There was every chance he would be our next prime minister. And it looked like forty was a ceiling. It looked like forty percent was a ceiling uh, uh, or, floor. or a floor. Yeah. A ceiling and a floor, like a whole house. Yeah. It was a house. But, and 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 you'd expect that because National. National really successfully consolidated the centre right vote in two thousand and five. They crushed United Future. They crushed ACT. They l- diminished New Zealand First. You know they really created a, a, a large super party in an MMP environment, which has held very steady since. Um, so to drop to thirty percent, because you know, you know, it's not like when Labor drops to thirty percent and the Greens go up to ten. Right, these are voters who have left the centre right, mm. crossed that median strip, mm. and gone over to support a centre left government. So that you know, so this is worse. It is for national, but also those are people 30%. who are going to go back. Like so, they, so so when the when the you know like when the recession bites or you know pick your own cliche, they're going back. You know, and and the question for I mean, it's as you put it in your column for the spinoff.co.nz this morning, Ben, the question is whether or not Bridges is a net gain or a net loss to that to that to that move. You know? oh, and, 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 and I mean the, because there is a reasonable <coughs> there is a reasonable argument to be made that th- those people are moving back when it starts to get really fucking bad out there economically, as it will, as as no one would really deny. And there is a reasonable argument to be made that a tub of lard would bring more people back to the National Party as leader than Simon Bridges. Which which brings us back to Todd Muller, right? Yeah. The you know a, 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 a sheepdog with a National Party rosette, mm. uh, you know, and and you know we can't yeah we can't discount how bad things you know how unlucky Bridges has been in this, but we also have to acknowledge that. Politics is not about individuals' personal journey towards fulfilment and, and and achieving goals. It's not about Hillary Clinton fulfilling her childhood dream of being president. It's not about Simon Bridges really wanting to stay leader of the National Party. You know, they, he he may well he may well remain the leader, but but that can't be the reason. And and the fact that he has suffered bad luck can't be the reason that you would keep him on because everything has changed those a lot of people will come back to national in the medium term so long term is a massive four months away which is the election short term is you know one month medium term is two to three months in the medium term yeah look unemployment is going to be catastrophic it's going to hit up to 10 percent by um by september that that's i think that's conservative estimate one thing to remember is that when we have 3.5% unemployment in New Zealand, that's basically zero. That's basically everyone who wants a job apart from a tiny, tiny core of long-term unemployed uh, in work, and then that 3.5% just reflects people on short-term uh, breaks between jobs. So when you're talking about going from 4.2%, as we were in January, up to 10%, that's not three times as much unemployment as we we, we had in January. That's, uh, you know... Sp- what fifteen times much as much unemployment? You know, it will be a very, very different country, and I mean, you know, you could argue about whether this helps or hurts Labor. I mean, you know, if Labor have been searching for the missing million of unemployed voters and <laughs> marginalised people uh, for a long time, you know, and if you can't find them, make your own, right? <laughs> get get five hundred thousand more people on benefits. That that should help the centre left, but. Um, but you know, so so you know, people will come back, you know, or, or will leave that will leave Labour. 
whether they come back to national will depend on how much they personally like the leader, what sort of credible alternatives being offered. Um, and then the other thing is the self-fulfilling prophecy of the polls, which is if three months out, National are still not in a position to form a government. At that point, people who bitterly oppose Labour and blame them for job losses and think that they're not handling the economy well and see David Clark still somehow in a ministerial position have a few options. They can vote for National to keep their numbers up in opposition. They can vote for Winston Peters in New Zealand first to act as a handbrake on the Labour government. Or they can vote for ACT to sort of stiffen the spine of ideological resistance to the government. We've seen all of those scenarios play out before. Um, and if if they go for those two latter options, then National, you know, could decline even further. Then you might be... You've got a 2002 scenario. 2002 scenario yeah. where they plummeted to 21% under Bill English. Um, well, that's a thorough thesis. Hello there, Simon Pound here from another spin-off podcast with a little bit of cross-promo for you. If you might be into the stories of Aotearoa's most interesting entrepreneurs and innovators, you might like to check out Business is Boring, the podcast I host that reckons it's anything. But if that sounds like a bit of you, it's available through the spin-off or wherever you find your favourite podcasts. Hey, if you love the spin-off, the best way to show it is to become part of the spin-off members. It's fun that helps keep us free and accessible to all without a paywall, and it funds some of our most important and respected journalism. Let's talk, because we should, also a bit about the government. Um, because while it's pretty hard to argue anything other than the group of senior ministers and senior staffers have done a kind of outstanding job in terms of uh, leading and uh, policy making and communicating in the aftermath of the unimaginable COVID crisis. There is equally what looks like a fairly shallow talent pool around them. And uh, if you were the National Party, you can point to a lame duck Health Minister, who you mentioned, David Clark, you can point to a uh, Deputy Leader of the Labour Party in Calvin Davis and Tourism Minister who is being roundly attacked by a tourism industry, and we, we could debate um, whether or not that's reasonable. Uh, and you've got a Minister of Economic Development and Minister of Transport who is responsible for Kiwi builders and had to give up on the light rail. I mean, you know, there's a, there's a certain, you sort of feel as though there's a little bit of a triumvirate an operation with Labour that has done, I think, an outstanding job. You look at uh, Jacinda Ardern, Grant Robertson, David Parker. Um, Chris Hipkins has performed really well, I think. Uh, but, but, but you quite quickly move to, I mean, as it starts to get back to business as usual a bit, these ministers who are being kept from p appearing at the Epidemic um, mm. Response Committee, ministers who have been sent a memo that tells them they don't need to, that they shouldn't appear in interviews and they don't need to, they don't need to, um, they, they can dismiss rather than explaining. Is that a problem? Is that a problem for them, do you think, Annabelle? I, I think um, oh, that email being leaked was definitely a problem mm. for them and I'd be interested to know who did it and, and why and if anything has been done to... to, to identify who it was. I think the wording of that email was really unfortunate and obviously not meant to make it into the public. Mm. Um, but but sending out those sort of messages to your caucus, I would have thought that there's actually nothing very unusual about that and all and at all and that probably it was a fairly standard um um, approach for national. I think the interesting, when they were government, I think the interesting thing that COVID has done is as it's narrowed our focus down onto just the leadership, it's really um, played to Labour's strengths mm. and unfortunately for Simon, played to national's weaknesses because in Jacinda Ardern we have this amazing communicator who is... You know, like you say, she's got her her tight group around her her who are competent, but 
but outside of that it starts to to get a bit thin on the ground so it's 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 highlighted her mm. and the weaker people have fallen away and it's had the opposite effect in national where you know your other strong players have melted into the background and Simon's become the focus of, mm. of all the media attention which has also probably um, added to the public's um, dislike of him. And it's certainly a difficult line to, line to run as an opposition that um, as soon as you start drawing attention to the talent pool around them, it's almost as good as saying we've lost the battle for having a, <laughs> having a strong leader, right? Yeah, absolutely. And it, it, we've seen oppositions try and do this before. Labour kept trying to do it yeah. when they had poor leaders yeah. um, or leaders who didn't connect. You know, look at the team. Yeah. Um, you know, the team should be four or five people at most. You know, it should be recognisable people. Um, the we're It's still a problem for the government, though. I mean, in the campaign, mm. the attention will be on the leaders. It'll be Jacinda versus Bridges slash Muller. Mm. Um, Cut one of those out. Now. <laughs> on the other hand, um, you know, in the ordinary course of life, in the wake of an economic collapse that's coming... Uh, ministers can't hide forever. I mean, we've already seen, you know, Twyford's been under house arrest and he's still managed to, you know, lose the light rail somewhere. Um, it, you know, the business of government doesn't stop. They have a huge competence gap. They have since the beginning. And and what's worse is that so, the f- part of that small core of people who were identified as trusted high performers from opposition, David Clark and Phil Twyford, have turned out to be some of the worst of the lot. Where Labour can address this is that, you know, currently they're writing very high in the polls. Mm. What they should basically be doing right now is like a global talent search. Mm. They should be, I mean, they should be breaking down the door mm. of infectious disease expert and Labour candidate for the, de- and, and elected member of the Capital Coast DHB, Aisha Verrill, who mm. did that contact tracing report. Mm. They should be literally like shoving her in a car and and, and she you know she would she would wake up from being drugged at a labor selection meeting and mm. she'll be told she's the next minister of health after the election mm. they they have a very strong position to attract talent from you know part, part of the reason that their talent pool is so bad is because in 2011 and 2014 their results were so disappointing that none of the you know most of the decent newcomers didn't make it from the list and so everyone was too scared to go on in 2017, and they ended up with a lot of the people that they have now, um, you know, when they unexpectedly peaked because of Ardern. Right now, they are guaranteed to gain seats. They can they can basically draft in some star players, mm. you know, and, and look, it'll hurt a few feelings on the back bench. But if you can bring in nationally recognised experts, um, which they should be able to attract at this stage, um, you know, they, they can they can address that competence problem during the campaign, if not in the months leading up to it, where certainly some of their ministers will screw up the response. Um, Good plan, Ben. Yeah, it's, it's, it's absolutely that. true that I think there are various people who would have in the years, uh, the key years, have gravitated towards uh, launching political careers with, say, the Green Party, um, because the Labour Party just mm-hmm. looks so hapless, will now be, as you say, um, like, taking the meetings. Let's talk briefly um, about what we had originally meant to be discussing, which is the budget, um, which seems, because as we know, time doesn't exist in any linear sense any longer, um, was only a week ago um, and was, a, as trailed, a once in a hundred years budget. It was included a $50 billion rescue fund with $20 billion of it yet to be allocated. Um, but... Uh, was criticised too for not being the transformational budget that some would have liked to have seen, uh, remembering of course that Jacinda Ardern was the one who used the word transformational, um, uh, counter argument to that being that you don't necessarily want to completely rebuild the um, the uh, ship while you're trying to sail it out of a storm. Um, Grant Robertson in the lead up did however use the metaphor that if your house had burnt down, you wouldn't build it back the same way. What do you? What did you? What did you make of the of, of the budget and and its its meaning, Annabelle Lee Mather? I think that, by and large, the economic response to COVID has been 
pretty strong, um, but there has been a few anomalies, I think. Um, the government not taking the opportunity to really pump up, you know, if they're serious about addressing child poverty, I would have thought that we would have seen a lot more um, investment serious investment um, mm. in, in that area. And as you say, Ben, um, as a, 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 it's kind of amusing to me that, you know, we're talking about um, rising unemployment potentially as high as, as 8%. Um, that's what the Māori unemployment rate is at the moment. And when we interviewed Tau Henare for Ma Tangirea when he was Minister of Māori Affairs, Māori unemployment was at 20%. Mm. So it's funnily enough, it feels like New Zealand's getting a, a little bit of a taste about of what it's like to be Māori when, you know, the um, Crown comes in and uh, imposes all these laws <coughs> upon you and, um, and you uh, suffer um, from with the unemployment and economic insecurity and um, th- th- this concern about, you know, future the generations, uh, future generations having to pay off this massive debt. I saw a, a tweet by um, Reverend Hidini Ka where he talked about, for Māori, that's nothing new when you've had your land um, taken off you by wars and laws mm. and, and, your, um, and your future generations have been... Um, uh, hugely economically disadvantaged but yet there's no um, burning desire to level out the playing field Mm. for them so it's creating an it's yeah it's an it's created a new interesting dynamic in the country and what I, I what I think you know may happen is as we see more middle class Pākehā being forced onto benefits which is awful and terrible but unlike Māori I think they won't tolerate as much shit in terms of the appalling treatment that they get from wins and the lack of... Um, of and trying of, to live off that amount And trying of to live money. off a disgraceful, shameful yep. amount of money every week. And, you know, as we've seen, you know, $67 million for Fletcher's in wage subsidy and then they go and lay off a whole lot of people anyway. That's that's almost as much as what Taranaki got for the the... the you know, having all of the millions of acres that have right. removed from them. Right. So it'll be interesting to see if with this massive influx of of people coming onto the benefit, if we actually see some some changes it was inter- happen there and, and maybe a better a better go for our beneficiaries. We had a ran a piece yesterday morning from Marama Davidson, who is the co leader of the Green Party, um, saying that the budget it was kind of one of those sort of carefully worded pieces that was trying to criticise the budget but not too much because obviously mm. they're a support party which was kind of a sequel to a piece that also ran on the spin-off from Julian Gender after that big infra- infrastructure mm. spend which was widely criticised by many Green supporters for not really, for being so road focused mm. um, and uh, the, the, the piece yesterday uh, got a bit lost in the middle of the, the, the national coup and, 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 and other things but it does Sort of, it will be interesting to see how it plays out going into the election and how hard the Greens will push on that because benefits went up by twenty five dollars. Mm. That was one of the first things that was done. Mm. Yeah, it's true, um, but not in the, the budget. Didn't see any any other lift in benefit levels. We had an advisory group that suggested that the entire bene, bene, the entire welfare system was completely um, completely outdated and failed. You know, and, and and, and the vast majority of their recommendations were completely ignored. Completely ignored, yeah. It sort of seemed to have got filed, basically. Mm. Um, and, um, I mean, it's to your point a bit, Ben, about where some of the vote might go for in, in terms of on the right, how much it might go to New Zealand first. The Greens are going to run a campaign that is, if you want the Labour Party to be what you thought they would be, rather than centre, you have to vote for us. But... It's going to be a hard argument. That's be- a hard argument because they're already there. And La- Labor, it's Labor already runs a government qua sine non. The Greens, uh, oh, very they, good. Very thank good. you. Thank yeah, you. well done. Oh, Just yeah. take a moment. Bit of, bit of yeah. lockdown duolingo. Yeah, I love no. it. <laughs> the um, 
you know, the, the Labor already can't pass a budget without the Greens. You know, the, the Greens, it's hard for them to argue that they will have more influence if they have 7% or 8% or, or whatever. There, there is an argument that if New Zealand first are gone, mm. uh, the Greens have more sway. Mm. Um, but it is absolutely, if, 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 the, if the personalities in the Green Party were the personalities, some of the personalities in New Zealand first, then they would be kicking some shit up. Right, they would be saying, "Where's our stuff?" You know, and said mm. they they sent out quite polite press releases a lot about a win for blah blah blah, mm. and you know, I mean, James Shaw got uh, the carbon zero bill through. You know, that's the which included negotiations with with, with Todd with Todd, Todd, <laughs> Todd Muller, um, who uh, you know, which is which is something. But I don't know. What do you think, Annabelle? Do you do you feel like it's if if you if you were advising the Green Party, would you start? Uh, withholding support for some things, start making a song and dance, or would you do same old? Remembering they they did get over five percent. What did they get in the new sub poll? Like nearly six, I think. Whereas New Zealand First was two and a half. Should they be should they be shouting more loudly about those that part of about that part of the equation? I, I, I think um, I'd be telling them to flex for sure, mm. a- and that's the simple difference between. Um, New Zealand, New Zealand first, and the Greens is Winston, you know, because mm. Winston flexes all day mm. long. His, his, you know, whether or not you agree with it, his supporters hear exactly what he is doing, you know, and he'll scream bloody murder from the rooftops if anybody tries to push through anything that he, mm. you know, that he doesn't agree with. And I, I don't think it would hurt the the Greens to, um, to be. Um, a bit more outspoken on those sorts of things. Yeah, and, and Shane Jones as well, yeah. obviously. Um, I think part of the problem is that the Greens don't have a single MP, certainly not at that ministerial level, who has both the temperament mm. to kind of stir things up and also the experience and knowledge of the system to know how to do yeah. that. Um, so Marama obviously can be very oppositional, but I think tends to get a bit lost in process stuff. She isn't very good at navigating the environment within Parliament, it doesn't seem. Um, whereas James Shaw, you know, can find his way around the beehive and policy, uh, but you know, I mean, look, he's a consultant. He's not a. He's not. Also, a, he's, also, he's, also he's, he's not a, a firebrand. Also, he's a he's a senior minister, though though I not though not in cabinet. Whereas, whereas Munro Davidson isn't. I well, look, Shane, Shane, Shane Jones is a senior minister in cabinet, but yeah. he he still manages mm. to um, yeah. you know make his presence felt. And this is not a criticism of them. They're just two. You, you know. In in the same way that the Greens, the you know, you could say there are two sides to their party as a support party. Uh, New Zealand First has two sides, but they're all they're encapsulated in the same individuals who can sort of turn on a dime. Um, you know, Winston Peters and Shane Jones know how to be disruptive in a in a process oriented way, um, which I don't think any of the Greens do. You would think uh, Chloe Swarbrick and Golris Gardaman, uh, I think. Have the potential to do that. They're mm. both they're both good operators, and are both um, what shall we say? Maybe a bit more um, a bit more. Uh, Find a few Latin term. Dr- 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 yeah. <laughs> sine qua non. Yeah, a bit, a bit, um, a bit more. Maybe driven to Over differentiate to the Greens than some of their other ministerial um, colleagues. Part of it too is just flying hours. Like the Greens have never been in government before, hmm. and I, and. You know, I do think that, you know, it's such a shame that Matidia isn't in Parliament at the moment because I feel like that's definitely the role she would have taken and had she been the Minister of um, MSD, that I think there would have been a lot more in the budget. Certainly an interesting kind of thought experiment to imagine what uh, uh, Russell, Norman and Matidia <laughs> today would be in, 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 in that grouping. Hey, um... Oh, uh, Speaking of smaller parties, there's also the, the Māori Party um, who uh, are starting to take a kind of unexpected form in a way. We've got, we've got Debbie Ngārewa Packer, a co-leader, mm. who's now co-leader with, 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 with John Tummy Hede, mm. which, I mean, we haven't talked about that because it's it's one of those things that, every, you know, the, the, that would that would have been a quite a, 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 a fairly big political story. It just got overwhelmed by everything else. How's that going to work, Annabelle? 
Yeah, it's interesting because uh, the Māori Party have always been able to um, sell themselves as the party of resistance, as the party who took the ultimate moral stand and yeah. voted against the foreshore and forged, seabed legislation. Forged out of that resistance. Mm, and, um, and now they're being led by someone who voted for that legislation. So it'll be right. interesting to see right. how they spin that one out. Um, and there were, we, you know, one of the one of the few missteps or U turns or whatever you want to call it was over Tangihanga. I mean, it was mm. Tangihanga and funerals, and mm. the numbers were changed. But the the most compelling part of the backlash against that came from Te Ao Māori, mm. um, in terms of saying you've got to be kidding ten people at a tangi when you can have a hundred people at Leo Malloy's. Um, mm you know, debauched <clears throat> waterfront pub. Mm. Um, I don't know. There was talk during that that that, that 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 could create a backlash, but are those Māori seats now basically done and dusted? Are we, is, it, is, it a, is, it a, is it a royal flush for the Labour Party again? I, I wouldn't want to say it's a, a royal flush because there's still a little bit of, you know, time between now and then. And yeah. So I would say that so long as nothing catastrophic happens between now and then, that it's more than likely that they will take out at least six of the seats. Mm. Um, I, I think that um, that um, Deborah um, does pose a threat in Te Tai mm -hmm. um, She's a very strong candidate. She's getting a lot of air time. She's a great communicator. She's popular. She's on the front line. Um, I, I understand that Adrian Dudafi is a is a strong electorate MP. Mm. Um, but I do think that if there are any um, weaknesses in you know, within those Māori seats for Labour, that that could possibly be it because she is such a such a strong candidate. Um, we've probably been talking long enough, so should we wrap it up? But um, just quickly, Annabelle, you and your uh, multi-award winning acclaimed television programme, The Hui, you've got something on the RMA uh, sort of uh, changes that are being rushed through? We do. We've got a nice story with Ngāti Teata, who... Um, the, uh, their mate, matriarch, who's obviously passed away now, the late Dame Ngani Gorman Hinnock, she sort of spearheaded um, the drive to have um, Māori values enshrined within the, the RMA, like Kaitiaki Tanga and the need yeah. to consult with Māori and the treaty and all of that stuff. So they're concerned because the government is proposing. Um, legislation to fast track the RMA process by sidestepping it altogether so that they can get their shovel shovel ready mm. uh, projects underway um, and if that happens and there's no um, there's no consultation with Māori then obviously that is a huge issue and an explosive issue so um Especially coming after the some of the the uproar around that alert level two bill, the the, the public health bill that was rushed through in forty eight hours, which yeah. included in its original form some wording that was very concerning about warrantless entry on Marae. Mm, which of course for Māori just brings back memories of the you know raid in Te Uriwera as yeah. a result of the Terrorism Suppression Act. So so long as nobody tries to put any funky ass legislation through like that, I, I wouldn't think that Labour has too much of a problem in the Māori seats. But anyway, Ngā, Ngāti uh, Te Atta just talk about um, their concerns around the RMA. It's obviously um, still going through Cabinet um, so there may be some changes, but it hasn't been um, clarified yet what provisions are going to be made for Māori consultation mm. within that fast-track process. Mm. With, with that fast-track process, I mean, the easiest way around that for the government is um, to partner with Iwi on the Shovel Ready projects. Um, you know, there, I think there, there's been a bit of concern around that um, from the prime, uh, from the finance minister's uh, comments in his speech that they might just be basically going to local government and government agencies to spend all of this money, mm. which, if you think about it, is not really the seat 
of the kind of forward thinking, modernizing the economy, new ways of doing things, mm. innovation that, uh, you know, they originally sort of trumpeted for this fund that now turns out to be $3 billion. Mm. Um, and you would think that you'd be getting the iwi in to help on regional development there. Well, it's definitely, you know, it's definitely boom time for shovels. You know, like you just, just everyone's just getting shovels. I've got a shovel and in my car. Is Give also it. hammer ready. I'm ready for the new economy. Are you hammer ready? Just, it's. Um, I'm hammer ready. Um, uh, and then play out with hammer time there or something. Yeah. I guess just end yeah, the podcast. Yeah, yeah. What have you got on this weekend, Ben? You probably on. You seem to be on every time I turn on the radio or the television. There's Ben Thomas uh, being an uh, expert commentator. I think I'm on the Nation. Oh, yeah. Are you? Oh, and Q and A on set. Uh, oh, oh, really? <laughs> I think so. Don't 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 tell them. Don't tell them though. They might they might Your cancel Thursday. me if there's a conflict. Wow. I'm like I'm cheating on them. Uh, I, feel, <laughs> I feel privileged to get this amount of time with them. Don't yeah. you? You're one thirsty little commentator. Oof. Come in, come in. Thanks, Alice, for your help today in making this in real life podcast possible. Thank you to Flick Electric for being very cool. Thank you to Spinoff members for being very cool. Thank you to Annabelle, Lee Mather. Thank you to Ben Thomas. I'm Toby Manhire. Bye. Bye. Are you curious about how business can be better? I'm Simon Pound, and I host Business is Boring, a podcast where I caught it all with some of the most interesting people in entrepreneurship, commerce, and making things happen. Tune in to Business is Boring every Tuesday, brought to you by the Spinoff Podcast Network in partnership with Spark Business Lab. Do you find it hard staying optimistic with all the financial news in the media? I'm Bernard Hickey, and on my podcast, When the Facts Change, I'm here to help you navigate the ever-changing landscape of economics in Aotearoa. So join the conversation every Friday on When the Facts Change, brought to you by the Spin-Off Podcast Network in partnership with KiwiBee. The Spin-Off Podcast Network.